you've got a room full of CCOs, right? And CCO liability. I can liability. see where this is heading. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, I, I try to telegraph. You know, I, I'm not trying to trick you. Um, you know, CCO liability has been a theme as well. It was on, it came up in probably half of the panels yesterday um, from, from Karen Barr's discussion with Commissioner Stein onwards. Um, my sense is that the enforcement staff has been trying to calm the waters on that debate a little bit, but I'd like to give you a chance to, to give your thoughts on CCO liability. Yeah, I'm not sure it's as much to try to calm the waters, but it's to try and communicate as clearly as we can how, how we think about the issue. I mean, I guess there's two things I would say to you, and you've probably heard them before, uh, but can't say them enough. Um, the first is, it does seem to get a little bit lost in the discussion about this issue. Um, that we have brought a number of enforcement cases in support of the compliance function um, and to identify how important it is for firms to properly research, resource compliance and support compliance officers. We brought a case last year um, where we charged the president of an investment advisor with um, causing the firm's compliance violations largely by ignoring the pleas from the CCO to increase resources that needed to be devoted to compliance testing and compliance uh, generally. And so that's important. We brought other cases. We brought a case under the new rule that uh, prohibits lying to the CCO. And so there's a whole other side of the ledger that it's important to look at, and I think it reflects our view of how important the compliance function is. When you talk about the cases against uh, CCOs, I mean, Andrew gave a speech on this last November, um, and we've tried to, to get that word out uh, as much as we can. But in fact, what he said there is really how we think about those cases. We really do think about them in three buckets. Cases where a CCO is involved in affirmative misconduct, usually in situations where they wear more than one hat, and it's usually that other hat that causes them to uh, get involved in the conduct that, that's a violation. The second bucket is cases where CCOs are involved in affirmatively misleading us or obstructing our investigations. And we don't think, and I guess I'm sure you don't think that there's any issue with either of those categories. The third category is what we end up talking about, and it's the one where, from our perspective, the CCO reflects sort of a wholesale failure to carry out responsibilities that are specifically assigned to that person. And that's the category that people talk about. But, you know, although it's gathered an enormous amount of attention because we brought two cases in one year. I and mean, the fact is, those cases are extraordinarily rare. Um, and um, they're much rarer than the first two categories. And if you look at it over time, going back to like 2002 or 2003, it's actually a small handful of cases. Way, I hesitate to even talk about numbers with Mark here, but this is like addition, so I'm okay. Um, it, it's, I mean, it's less than one a year, way less than one a year. Um, and so it's not something that really, the fact that two happen to come in one year, it's not a trend. We bring cases when they're ready to be brought. And um, it's really not, people shouldn't read more into it than it is. Um, look, I, there is, I, I assume there's a lot of disagreement about um, what's right or wrong. We're not trying to second guess people's good faith judgment. Um, I would suggest um, that I know a lot of people get most of their information about this issue by listening to people like us talk about these things or from reading blogs or articles. If you're really concerned about those issues, read the orders, I would suggest. Read the orders and see what exactly happened, what the commission found, and then ask yourself, is that really okay? I mean, is that really something that seems like just, you know, straight up good faith behavior? Because I, we didn't think so, the commission didn't think so. So let me ask you, sort of in a, on a bigger picture, um, in a bigger picture sense, the, there's a national discussion going on, it's a political discussion on the campaign trail about individual culpability for corporate misdeeds, bringing Wall Street crooks to justice, you know, whether it's um, Bernie Sanders or it's, it's um, Senator Warren or, you know, it, there's, a, there's a larger discussion here. There was, I think, folks in this audience may not have taken note last year a memorandum from the Department of Justice called the Yates Memo that outlined when and how they should bring criminal actions against individuals for corporate misdeeds. And that seemed on some level to ramp up kind of the targeting of individuals. How much, if at all, does that larger dialogue influence the SEC's thinking about the cases? 
It, it really doesn't at all. I mean, the Yates memo, which is an, a memo from the Deputy Attorney General, really is no new news from the perspective of what we do at the Commission. I think you heard from Commissioner Stein yesterday that how focused she is on individual responsibility. And the fact is, the vast majority of our enforcement cases include individuals. If you look back over the last five years or so, roughly 80% of the cases that we brought include individuals. That's a huge, uh, a huge percentage. And the other things that are set out in the Yates memo, you know, getting cooperation credit for identifying misconduct by individuals, that's something that's always been a part of our program. You look at the Seaboard report from 15 years ago, and that's, it's part of that. Um, we've always dealt with claims against the entity separately from claims against the individuals. Um, and maybe most importantly, as anybody who's been in enforcement at all recently knows, that when we go to the commission with a recommendation for a claim against an entity, but not a claim against individuals, that's something we've got to explain. And it's something that the commission is very skeptical about because their instinct, in, in, in part because it's just, it, it's, it's a right question to ask is, who is responsible for what happened here? And so it's something that we're focused on, and the Yates memo is released. It, it's old news from our perspective. Okay. 